So I'll start with giving you some takeaway points of what I hope to convey today. So uh, one is that people around the world are struggling with stress. Um, Long-term stress, stress that lasts for months to years, is bad. But short-term stress, fight-or-flight type stress responses, can actually be good. Going from bad to good stress is likely to increase immunity, enhance mental and physical performance, and perhaps create conditions that favor and enable peace. And I'll try and sort of cover these uh, different levels in the next few slides. So now typically when we all think about stress, we know that it has a bad reputation, right? The belief that stress is harmful is almost universal, and it's become an interesting aspect of business and advertising worldwide. And the central message that you often see is that stress is bad for you, so pay us to make it go away. Okay, and, and, and I really appreciate going to different countries around the world, either to give talks or to visit, and I really like to try to understand how different cultures in different places are grappling with the concept of stress, and to a certain extent, how they're using the concept of stress to sell stuff. So sometimes you come across interesting examples. Here I'm stuck in a traffic jam in the city of Mumbai in India a few years ago, and I look up at this pedestrian overpass, and it says, stressed out, refresh with a kingfisher, right? So stress is bad for you, give us your money and we'll give you a beer and make your stress go away. So I was going to give a talk in Germany a few years ago and I said, I wonder whether people in that part of the world use the concept of stress to sell beer. And sure enough, look at what I found. I found beer spas, okay? So it says here, the beer is all natural products and has ability to stress slowing down. That's exactly what it says. And even the New York Times actually covers this. So I, I think it is real. And then, um, last year I was going to give a talk in Switzerland, and so of course I wondered, do they use the concept of stress to sell chocolate in Switzerland? And look at this, okay? They do, <laughs> right? All right. And uh, actually coming close to home, I was going to hide this slide, but it stayed there. So there's DOGA for stress reduction in New York, Chicago, I think coming soon to Milan, and uh, you know, so you, so you get the point. Um, so let's look at the numbers though, okay? That's like a nice way of sort of give, giving you uh, an idea about how different people grapple with stress and what we think, right? But the numbers look pretty bad, right? So 69% of the people say that work is a significant source of stress for them. So this is from the American Psychological Association where they have uh, summarized uh, facts from, from different sources. Okay, 51% say that stress actually affects their productivity. Okay, 25 is the median number of days that are lost due to stress and anxiety from work. Now just think about this. Six, in comparison, is the median number of days that is lost due to non-fatal injury and illnesses. So it's a significant skewing in, 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 towards the side of stress. By some estimates, about $300 billion is the estimated cost of job stress in the U.S. alone. And when you look at these numbers, they look pretty bad, but what you want to keep in mind is these above numbers are just for work stress in the U.S. They're not counting physical, family, environmental, and other stressors that people here, and importantly, all over the world are dealing with. So here's a poster from the National Library of Medicine that makes this point about stress quite nicely. And it says, Stressed, stress is a loaded gun. Okay, it says out here, if left untreated, stress will kill you just as surely as a bullet. Don't wait for the gun to go off. Get help today. Okay, and for the first few slides, for the first half of my talk, I request you to consider the following with me, okay? That Mother Nature gave us a stress response to help us survive, not to kill us. So while this situation in this poster, as well as the numbers that you saw before, is indeed true, it need not always or necessarily be the case that stress is this big, bad pathological entity. Okay, so let's define stress. What do we mean by stress when we sort of study it or talk about it? So we define stress as a constellation of events that begins with a stimulus. This is your stressor or your stress-inducing agent that precipitates a reaction in the brain. This is stress perception that then results in the activation of fight or flight systems in the body. This is your biological stress response. And it's absolutely essential to understand that this biological response is absolutely necessary in order for anything stressful that is going on outside the individual or even in the head of the individual, for anything stressful to have any effect on the body, to have any of the bad effects of stress, you need this biological stress response. Okay? So now we all agree that if a cheetah walked into this room or a lion walked in and roared, I thought it was always going to do that in your last slide, but then the lamb was there to keep things calm, right? 
immediately you have a stress response, right? A prototypical predator comes in, heart rate goes up, blood pressure goes up, adrenaline, noradrenaline, cortisol, cytokines, they begin to flood your bloodstream. And that's the way the brain gives the message to the body that something bad or challenging is about to happen or is already happening, okay? But so a lion is easy to understand. Well, something like I'm doing right now, okay, or maybe my fellow speakers are more experienced and it doesn't really stress them out too much, right? But giving a talk like this, right, in front of a social setting can also be stressful to different extents. But think about this, voluntarily exercising, okay, even if you like the exercise, you don't feel that it's stressful running around the beautiful, you know, streets over here, okay, or on a treadmill, you volunteer, voluntarily do this, it activates the same biological response. Okay, and getting even more exotic, unfortunately, Jim's not here anymore. We're talking about first kisses, okay? Something as intensely exciting or excitatory, okay, such as approaching someone for a first kiss, especially if the person doing the approaching is romantically challenged, okay, would activate the same biological stress response. Okay, in fact, sexual intercourse is a potent activator of this response. So what's going on, right? It's not always a danger stimulus that's activating that biological stress response. So one of our central hypotheses was that just as the stress response prepares the cardiovascular, the heart, the muscles, and the hormones for fight or flight, under some conditions, the stress response may also prepare the immune system for challenges like wounding or infection that may be imposed by a stress-inducing agent, the stressor. Okay, in other words, short-term stressors, we hypothesized, will enhance immune function in compartments like the skin that are likely to be compromised by the actions of a stressor. So in nature, it could be the lion wounding a gazelle or a person, but in a modern medical context, it could be the process of undergoing surgery. And I'll show you one example with some data to sort of show you how this connects. Okay, now most research is understandably focused on long-term or chronic stress. So how do we define long-term stress? We define long-term stress as stressors that induce a stress response, a biological response that lasts for months to years in duration. Okay, we study this and many, many people study these. But we also believe that it's important to investigate and harness where you can the protective effects of mother nature's stress response, which is your short-term or acute stress response, okay? And this is where stress-related factors increase in the blood and other, other places for short periods of time, specifically defined as minutes to hours, and then shut down as soon as the need to be stressed or mount that stress response is over, okay? So this is acute or short-term, this is chronic long-term. So what are the kinds of short-term stressors we study? Well, we have a lab stressor that involves bringing the subjects into the lab, and they're asked to make a speech in front of an audience, except the audience is trained to specifically not be as kind and, you know, laughing at jokes and encouraging as you guys are, okay? And so you don't get any positive feedback, and that's socially stressful for the person trying to make a speech, like it would be for me if, if you guys are just sitting there looking at me like, or even shaking your heads. Also, we ask the people to do math, and typically when you ask someone to do math in public, that stresses them out even, you know, even more. Um, we also look at the process of undergoing surgery, short surgeries, elective surgeries, as a, as a different kind of stressor. And we always quantify the stressors by measuring hormones, measuring changes in physiology, changes in psychological states, such as affect, and also changes in behavior in some cases. So just to sort of give you one example, how does the immune system react during short-term stress is one of the questions that we initially asked. And I'm going to summarize many years' worth of work in this one slide. And what we found happens is that early on during the stressor, immune cells, which are like the body's soldiers that are sitting in barracks, the barracks of the body are organs like the spleen, these immune cells very early on during stress, within about 5 to 15 minutes of the beginning of a stress response, they leave their barracks, and enter the boulevards of the body, which is the bloodstream or the blood vessels. And so what you see is an increase in cell numbers in the blood very early during a stress response. Okay, cell numbers increase. This is within about two, five to, five to 15 minutes. As the stressor progresses, about 20 minutes on out, you begin to see a decrease in immune cell numbers in the blood because the immune cells of the body's soldiers are now leaving the boulevards of the body. They're leaving the blood vessels and they're going somewhere else. And they happen to be going to potential battlefields in the body, of which an example is the skin, okay? And what the stressor also does is it not only increases the number of defenders at potential battlefields by sending more immune cells to these potential sites, but it also increases their firepower. So if there is battle, an immune cell that is sitting in this 
uh, in the skin under stress conditions is better able to do its job than an immune cell that's sitting in, um, in the skin under non-stress conditions. Now people always say, but how do the cells know where the lion is going to bite the gazelle or where the surgeon's going to make the cut? And the point is that the cells do not know a priori where the site of attack will be. They are basically trafficking or traveling to all potential battle stations in the body when they receive the stress alarm signal from the brain. Okay, so the point is that short-term stress activates the body's defenses even before there is wounding or infection. Okay, so then the question is, okay, if that's true, does a short-term stress response experienced during surgery, vaccination, or cancer progression enhance immune function, especially in sites like the skin? And so we've done many studies to look at this, and the answer is yes. So if you couple a short-term stress response or a patient who mounts a good, robust short-term stress response while they're undergoing surgery shows enhanced recovery from their surgical procedure. If you couple a short-term stress response, such as a short burst of exercise or a psychological stressor with a vaccination, you enhance the response to the vaccine. Okay, and we are recently beginning to see that some types of anti-cancer immunity, this still requires quite a bit of investigation, actually all these do, okay, but we're just beginning to see that some types of anti-cancer immunity may also be enhanced if the system is physiologically pulsed with short-term stressors during the development of that immunity. So let me show you one clinical example with actually some, some data, just one slide. So here you're looking at recovery after knee surgery. Okay, so this y-axis is recovery after knee surgery. The x-axis is time measured after several week, weekly periods for one year after surgery. And the recovery measure is the Lysholm scale, which is the gold standard for recovery from knee surgery. And what you're going to see here is that the closed, closed squares, the black squares, represent the recovery response of patients who naturally could mount a robust, adaptive, protective stress response when they underwent surgery. So those who could mount a good stress response recover faster, they recover earlier, and they show significantly higher maximal recovery compared to those patients who did not, who for some reason were naturally not able to mount a good protective stress response when they underwent surgery. So their response is significantly lower, and they never reach, the patients who can't mount the good stress response, never reach the maximal recovery that the patients who do mount a protective stress response reach. So one of our goals then is to try to maximally harness the protective biology of short-term stress during surgery, vaccination, and cancer therapy. So in a clinical setting, try to understand how this works and try to see how we can use Mother Nature's protective mechanisms to help patients during times when they may need it. So the question is, Okay, what about bad stress, okay? And typically what we find is that long-term stressors, chronic stressors, again, stressors that last for months to years in duration, these are the kinds of stressors that ex exercise many uh, negative effects on, on the health, on health. Okay, and so examples are, you know, stress, depression is a kind of chronic stressor, living with chronic diseases or chronic or ever-present disease conditions is another kind of chronic stressor that we study, and then caring for somebody who you love who's chronically ill. It could be a child, it could be an adult. So caregiving stress are the kinds of long-term stressors that have these bad effects. Now, there are significant costs of long-term stress. So first, just to go on the immune theme, you have a decrease in protective immunity. You have an increase in biological aging. So biological aging of cells is accelerated the more chronic stress load an individual is experiencing. You see increased susceptibility in some cases to infection, some cases to cancer progression, and some cases of cardiovascular disease. Okay, so greater chronic stress will increase the probability that these things might happen. You also see increase in anxiety, fear, depression, so those negative emotions. All this can result in increased healthcare expenses, which is a pretty significant cost of high chronic stress. Also, cost in terms of time lost from work. So when a person can't be productive towards society, that's another cost that you have to bear in addition to the cost of actually caring for the person and hopefully making them well. You also see decreases in positive factors during chronic stress, like decreased motivation, decreased creativity, decreased efficiency, decreased productivity, and increased irritab irritability, anger, and aggression. So for the kinds of things that we are talking about today, this is going to make it less likely that a person's going to be nice to people around them, and then those people are going to be nice to people around them, and the ripple effects that can be set up in a positive way are going to be less likely if you have an increase in irritability, anger, and aggression. So therefore, there are likely to be many benefits of minimizing bad stress responses and optimizing good stress responses. So we are beginning to put together a scheme whereby we understand these in a hard medical context 
as well as try to come about working with many colleagues here as well as in other places to see, well, what could we actually do about it? What could, what could you as individuals actually do about it? So we proposed the idea of a stress spectrum where on one end of the spectrum, you have good stress. This is nature, mother nature's fight or flight, short-term stress responses. At the other end of the spectrum, you have bad stress. These are your long chronic stressors, right? So this is just a way of showing that stress-related biology increases, but then it stays elevated for long periods of time, which is what results in its negative effects. In between these two types of stress responses is the low stress or no stress resting zone. So this is your green zone. Now what you generally want for good health is the following, okay? You want to minimize your chronic stress exposure, okay? So minimize the bad stress maximize the zone, green zone of health and healing, and try to optimize, sharpen those good stress responses. So the point is, don't be afraid of stress, but just make sure that you've optimized your ability to mount those robust fight or flight responses when you need them and shut them off as soon as the need to mount those is over. And I recognize that saying, don't do this, don't do that, it's easier said than done, but the point is that when you set targets, then we at least know what we want to try to work towards. Okay, so how do you get there? Well, sleep, Nutrition and exercise seem to be major players. Nutrition and exercise in moderation, sleep as much as you can get that makes you feel rested. But then there are other ways, and here it'll be different strokes for different folks, because you find whatever floats your boat, right? So it could be meditation for some, yoga, I don't know if people levitate here, but if they do, dance, exercise, hiking, art, music, fishing, so on. And living compassionately, right? So with kindness and compassion may actually be not only good for you, but importantly, also good for people around you and could set up those resonating relationships. So the benefits of reducing chronic stress could not only help the individual, but could also help those around them. And hopefully, if enough of it happens and if it catches on, which I, hopefully, which I hope it will, like Facebook and Twitter, if it catches on, there could be ripple effects that really sort of have it spreading out. And so I want to sort of try to summarize that in the second last slide. So if one successfully find ways to reduce one's chronic stress, and it's okay if sometimes you try to do it and it doesn't work or you fail. That's fine too, right? So there's no need to be stressed about being stressed. But if one does one best, one's best to reduce their chronic stress levels at the individual level, what that's likely to do is decrease aggressive tendencies, decrease irritability, illness, depression, and increase performance, productivity, creativity, and compassion and kindness, right? So what this is likely to do is also help towards decreasing chronic stress levels in the immediate circle of this person, right? So I find myself, when I'm under a lot of stress, I often have to remind myself, saying, hey, you know what, your, your threshold for getting irritated is lower, so you sometimes inadvertently take it out on the people who are closest to you, right? So try not to do that. Remind yourself, if you can bring that down, what it also helps is bring down the chronic stress level in your immediate circle, at work, your family, your loved ones, and so on. This can actually, again, form a feed-forward loop to sort of create this positivity effect. If this really starts going on, you can imagine that people in your immediate circle with their chronic stress levels lower are likely to help larger groups of people. Their circles also lower their levels of chronic stress to, again, start these positive feed-forward ripple effects. Okay, so just as bad things can go radiate out and sort of multiply, good things can also multiply. And what you want to try to do is try one's best to set the situation towards that positive end of the spectrum. And so what this could result in is maximizing good stress, maximizing that resting zone that we talked about in the stress spectrum, increasing health and well-being, if one can do it successfully, and hopefully increasing performance, efficiency, productivity, and creativity setting the stage to, again, enhance pro-social behavior, compassion, and acts that lead to kindness and peace, which, again, if one does it, and if enough of it starts happening, can sort of ripple out and propagate on its own. So our goals are to maximally harness the biology of good stress in the clinical, individual, and societal settings. So until recently, I focused mostly on the clinical setting, but thanks to people I've worked with and been exposed to, I've also become extremely interested in looking at the individual and societal effects of these. You want to try to reduce and eliminate bad stress and maximize that zone of health, healing, and well-being. And it's important, wherever we can, to sort of genuinely, and as Jim was saying, authentically, uh, you know, try and work together to do this. So if there's anything that you think we do or know, please get in touch, that would be helpful to you, or you want to share about, uh, please feel free to get in touch with me, and I'd be happy to work with you or talk. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen.